from Anchored in Faith Gospel Church in Oxford, Iowa. This is Anchored in Faith. We're talking about the faithful remnant, which is one of the themes of the Bible. The faithful um, followers of God who aren't necessarily the establishment. In other words, the religious organization of the day, even in Israel's time, uh, wasn't composed of faithful people necessarily. Most of them were doing something else. So, uh, but there's a theme through the, through the scripture of people who are true to God, uh, people like uh, Moses and people like Caleb and people like Joshua, and people like Noah, um, and who hear from God, Abraham, who hear from God and obey. Now, they're not perfect people, but they... Uh, they listen to God when he speaks to them. Now, we're in the Old Testament. We're, we have to remember we haven't got to the giving of the law yet. So there's nothing written down until the time of Moses. Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and, and gets revelation from God and, you know, actually records the law. And, but before that, God's dealing with people directly. Uh, he's talking to them, as in the Garden of Eden. He's uh, appearing to them, as in Abraham. And, you know, he appeared to Abraham. Um, he appeared to Moses. Um, and so God's dealing directly. And now, we, of course, we have the Scripture. And that's where we should be going first for our guidance and our direction and and you know what we should be doing is the scripture now god can speak to us directly if he wants to i believe that but there's a lot of people today that uh depend on you know some new revelation every week um instead of really going and searching the scriptures and you know finding out what god really uh is is doing now Moses, we said, uh, is a lot like Paul. He grew up and was raised in the religious tradition of his day and turned his back on it. Now, remember Moses grew up as a prince in the household of Pharaoh. He might have been Pharaoh one day. That would, the Pharaohs would select their successor before they died and uh, he might have been the Pharaoh, but if not, he would have been a prince in Egypt, and he grew up in the court, and he knew all the, about their religion and all about their magic and all about everything. And Paul, same way, he, he was a Pharisee. He grew up, he knew the law, he was a doctor of the law, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, he was, you know, up there. But they both turned their backs on that to serve God. Now, let's read the, to refresh our memory, let's read the third chapter of Exodus. Remember, Moses killed the Egyptian. He was trying to deliver Israel in the flesh. He thought he could just start knocking off Egyptians and get them delivered. Well, it didn't work too well for him. He killed the Egyptian and fled to the desert. He got married to the daughter of the priest of Midian, that's Jethro, uh, and he's out in the desert, raising his family, having kids, you know, watching his sheep. So in verse or chapter three, it says, that when Moses kept the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, priest of Midian, now here's a man who's serving God. You find these people scattered, these Gentiles scattered through the Old Testament. Um, Melchizedek was a priest, just serving God. He had a revelation of the true God and was serving him. Jethro, the son of, he was a Midianite. They had their own gods, but he was a priest 
serving the true God. And so you see these people scattered through the Bible. Cornelius in the New Testament, he's a Roman. He's serving, he's serving God. He's praying to God, and God rewards him for that. But he's a Gentile, you know, he's a Roman. So this is one of those people that you see, and it says that he's uh, his father-in-law and drove the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, Horeb, which is also known as Sinai. It said, when the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked and beheld, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, this is, here, here we have, again, another example of one of the miracles of God, the burning bush, the bush that isn't consumed. Now, you can spend a lot of time trying to figure out what kind of bush is going to burn without being consumed and all this stuff. But you know, God only had to create one bush. He only had to create one fish to swallow uh, Jonah. You know, it, just let God be God and let him do a miracle. He's getting the attention of Moses. Moses has probably forgotten all about God. He figures, well, you know, I'm out here, I can't do anything, um, you know, God's not around. But he sees this sight, and he goes to it. Now, in our day, God's doing the same thing. My opinion, this is just my opinion, God's going to be moving in a more supernatural way than ever because we have a society that is so um, unaware of anything that it's like Pastor John used to say, I don't even know how God is going to speak to people who are always on their phone, always on the internet, always, you know, they're just totally digitalized, he's going to have to do something supernatural. Right. To, they're not reading the Bible. People out there aren't reading the Bible. They're not going to church. Uh, they're not doing much of anything. And we have this anonymous society now where everybody uh, wants to operate you know, anonymously. We don't want to face people. You know, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to witness to them and say, you know, you're lost. Well, that's offensive. Yeah, that's right. That hurts feelings. People don't want their feelings hurt anymore. They want safe spaces. They want um, places where they can just cover up and not have to face the world. And so, uh, to evangelize people now is very different than it was 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Uh, God has just got to get people's attention somehow. And I, I just, it's going to be a burning bush type of thing where it's just so out of the ordinary that they're going to have to go to it. And that's what Moses did. He wanted to see what it was. He didn't know it was God until it, the voice came and said, the angel of the Lord appeared to him. And when it says the angel of the Lord, this is usually Jesus appearing in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord. It said, appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush burneth not. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he answered, I am here. Then he said, come not hither, put thy shoes off thy feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now that's very similar to Paul on the Damascus Road. 
He's on his horse or his donkey or whatever, heading up to Damascus to kill some Christians. And Jesus appears and knocks him down, blinds him, and said, why are you, why are you persecuting me? And he said, you know, Lord, you know, he knew it was God. He knew exactly who he was talking to. And so, so does Moses. You know, he, he says, you know, he tells him, puts, put his shoes off. And he says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, Moses knew who he was talking to. He hadn't heard from God probably all his life, but he knew about God because his mother had raised him, even in the household of Pharaoh. See, there were faithful Israelites in Egypt. Most of them were not. Most of them were probably serving the gods of Egypt or nobody or just trying to get by or whatever. There was a faithful remnant in in Israel, even in captivity in Egypt. So his mother, who was his nursemaid and brought him, you know, raised him, taught him about God. He knew that God was going to send a deliverer. He didn't really know if it was going to be him, but when he killed the Egyptian and found out everybody knew about it and ran off, he figured, well, I'm not the deliverer. It's not me. It must be somebody else. Well, God is telling him that he's the one. He said, uh, <clears throat> then the Lord said, I have surely seen the trouble of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of the taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. Now, so God has not forgotten his people. They've been there 400 years. He's not forgotten them, and he's getting ready to, you know, deliver them from Egypt. Now, in the scripture, Egypt is a type of sin and bondage. We're all in Egypt before we get saved. We, we think we're doing fine. We're going along and singing our song and having a good time, and we think it's all good. But we're in bondage. Now, if you remember back when you were saved, what were you doing? You're on the devil's treadmill, weren't you? And so was I. And we uh, just went along and thought everything was fine. And so uh, Egypt is a type of bondage. And sin is bondage. Sin is, uh, it's the devil's treadmill. Now, I remember Samson, when he was blinded and, and made to walk and crush the grain, that's a treadmill. That was the old way of, of grinding the grain, was a treadmill. Usually they'd put an ox on there and they'd go around and the grain would go in and they'd crush the hulls and then they'd separate it. Well, that's, now a treadmill, you know, is where you, what you run on. But, you know, when you run on a treadmill, you don't go anywhere. The scenery doesn't change. You know, you're still running. I run on a treadmill once in a while and, it, you know, you might have a TV or something, but it's not like running outside where you go and you see, you know, something, but it just goes and goes and you go round and round and you're not getting anywhere. And so, you know, Egypt is a type of bondage and just like Babylon in the, in the scripture is a type of religious confusion. Because you have all these gods, we can talk about that later, but Babylon was where, you know, everybody could do their thing. They had this big empire, and as long as you acknowledged the Babylonian gods, you could do your thing. The Jews could worship, they just had to acknowledge the Babylonian gods. And that's why most of them stayed in Babylon when they were allowed to come out. What about 10% came back to Israel? Most of them stayed. So that's kind of off the subject, but Egypt is always, Bible teachers will tell you, it's a type of sin. So 
they're in bondage and he's telling them that, that you know, he's getting ready to deliver them. And he's gonna, he tells him that in verse 8, Therefore I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land unto a good land and a large, into a land that flows with milk and honey, even unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, lo, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Now, it's like Pastor John used to say, you truly get saved when you're under, you come under conviction. You cry out to God because you know that you're undone. God reveals to you your condition that you are undone and lost. And you cry out. And when you cry out, then he'll answer you. And Israel's crying out. Now, they aren't really sure if anybody's listening, but they're crying out. And some of them are crying out to God. And that's who he's listening to, is the faithful ones in Egypt. Now, none of them wanted to be slaves, even the ones that were worshiping the Egyptian gods. And you know they were because when they got to the desert, what did they do? They made a golden calf, which was an Egyptian god. So a lot of them were worshiping the gods of Egypt. But they were all, didn't want to be slaves. And so they're crying out to get out of slavery. And so God says he's getting ready to deliver them. And he says, come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, and thou mayest bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said to God, who am I that I should go into Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, a couple of things are going on here. First of all, Moses doesn't want to go back no. to the court of Pharaoh because no. he grew up there and he knows they're going to kill him. Uh, and so he doesn't want to go back. He doesn't want to, and there's, of course there's a new Pharaoh who's different than the one probably that he uh, grew up under, but uh, he doesn't want to go back to face Pharaoh because, you know, he's afraid. He's afraid they're going to kill him. And he doesn't know anything about God. You know, he really doesn't know who's, you know, who's sending him. And he says, who am I? And so that's the way we are. You ever, who am I? I sh who am I to be up here? teaching the Bible, you know? Who are any of us to be in church? You know, there's a time when I would never been in, in a church, probably you too. You know, you, you weren't interested in being in church, especially a fundamental church or Pentecostal church. You know, where I grew up, the Pentecostals were on the other side of the tracks. They were below the watchtower. I was in the watchtower, they were below that on the social scale. So, you know, uh, there was a time when we wouldn't have been here. And so when God saves you, you say, well, who am I to go talk to this one or to go do this? You know, we've all felt that way. We don't feel like we should be. I mean, when you really meet God, you got to say, <laughs> you want me? You sure? So that's what Moses is saying. He says, uh, He says, who am I that, that I should, you know, go to Pharaoh? And he says, certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token of thee that I have sent thee, that after thou hast brought the people out, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, behold, when I shall come to the children of Israel and shall say unto them, the God of your fathers hath sent me to you, if they say unto me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God answered Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. Now, you got to understand that the reason Moses is asking this, one reason is that 
Pharaoh was worshipped as a god. The Pharaohs were worshipped as a god, and when they died, they were put with all the other gods, you know. And so for him to go before Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh is going to say, what God sent you, don't you know I'm God? And Moses understood that. Moses understood that he would be talking to a man who was worshipped as a living God. And so he says, you tell him that I am hath sent you. That's Yahweh in Hebrew, the I am. And that's the name of the God. And, and of course, Pharaoh's going to say, well, I haven't heard of that God. Who's that? You know, I'm God. I'm the only God you need to be concerned with. You're in my presence. And so he says, you know, you tell him that I am hath sent me, hath sent you. God spoke further to Moses, Thou shalt say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all ages. So, you know, Moses is trying to get out of this. He really, you know, is afraid to go back. And so God's going to have to convince him, you know, that he's going to be with him. So if you go down to um, verse 19, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go, but by a strong hand. Therefore, I, I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I do in the midst thereof. And after that, shall he let you go. He's already telling him that this is going to be a battle. That, that Pharaoh isn't going to cooperate. He's just not going to let him go. Because the slaves were doing his work. And he wasn't going to let them go. He was built, they were building his cities and roads and whatever was being built was being built by the slaves. So he didn't want them to go. And the Egyptians had other slaves besides the Hebrews. I mean, they took slaves from everywhere. You know, they bought them and sold them. And, you know, when they went to war, they captured slaves in battle. And so uh, to let the Hebrews go would be to let them all go. And actually, that's God's promise. Anybody could have left with, with the Hebrews when they put the blood over the doors. That was for anybody, that's right. you know, whether you were Israelite or not. And so Pharaoh didn't want to lose his slaves because back then in the ancient world, slavery was the, that's how everything got done. The Romans, you know, I mean, slaves, that was their, the Greeks, all of them. That was the basis of their economy, was slave labor. And so, Faber wasn't, didn't want to lose his slaves. And so he, you know, he says that, that he's not going to let him go, not going to let him go quietly. I'm going to have to bring judgment upon uh, Egypt. And that's what happened, because after the, after the exodus, historians will tell you Egypt went into decline. They were no longer the great power that they were when, you know, before Moses uh, came along. So Moses, uh, again, is, he wants to be faithful, but uh, he's, he's seeing that there's a price, just like Paul. Paul um, paid a price, you know. He didn't just jump up and go out and start preaching. You read the scripture, he was in the desert for three years. And again, in the New Testament, like the old, there was no revelation written down yet. Now, there was the law, but the New Testament hadn't been written. So Paul, in the desert, was being taught by who? Jesus, directly. He was getting direct revelation from God. Now to equip him to go out and do what he did. But he didn't just jump up like a lot of people do and say, oh, I'm going to go start this ministry. And then, you know, six months later, they're out of business. 
uh, we have to use a little bit of wisdom. God wants us to do things, but uh, we got to know something first. We have to be taught, and that's what the church is for. See, the church is to equip the saints to go out and win the lost, not to drag sinners up to the altar and get them saved. Now, that's fine if that's what we do. If that happens, that's great, but what God really wants us to do is to be equipped from the word and go out to wherever we go and win the lost. So Paul, just like Moses, uh, had to pay a price. He, had, he was blind for a while. He lost his sight. I mean, that's pretty major. I can't imagine being blind. Uh, but he was. He didn't know if he was going to ever see again. Uh, and so, you know, there's a price to be paid for being faithful. And both Moses and Paul paid that price. They were willing. You know, Paul uh, just, I mean, he turned his back on the, on the Pharisees and the whole Jewish establishment. And, I mean, that's why, they, that's why they came after him. Because the word went out, this guy is another rebel, you know, just like a lot of them. And, of course, the Romans, you know, they were happy to do anything they could to please the Jews. Because the Jews were very troublesome to the Romans. They were always rebelling. Whatever they could do to keep them quiet, they would do. That's why they gave Barabbas up and, you know, did some things like that. Because uh, they didn't want a, another Jewish revolt on their hands. What we see is that if you're going to serve God and be faithful, there's a price. Now, look at us. We don't have 500 people here. We're faithful. We are faithful. And God's faithful to us. Your faith is proven by your faithfulness. Your, your giving, your attendance, your witnessing, your life, those are indicators. But altogether, it, it shows a pattern of faithfulness to God and commitment. And faithful Jews would obey the law and, you know, whatever they needed to do, that's what made them faithful. And so the same with the Christian. You know, your overall lifestyle is what shows whether you have faith or not. And so we're, we're part of the remnant. There's a remnant today. And... They're not all here. We're not the only church that's serving God. I would never say that. But uh, it's not the big boom, boom ministries <laughs> that God's using. I don't believe so. I can't. If you can think of one, you tell me. But I just really haven't seen too many. So uh, I guess we'll close with just, you know, the idea that we need to just keep doing what we're doing. Stay keep praying. Keep, you know, telling your relatives yeah. and your friends and anybody about Jesus. And, you know, if we all go to jail, maybe we'll be in the same cell block. I don't know. But <laughs> it's getting that place, friends. I'm telling you. Yeah. It's really... Um, Yeah, it's just uh, more and more uh, the Christians are being marginalized uh, by everybody. Full sermons are available anytime at www.anchoredinfaith.org. Contact us by calling 319-828-4815 or write us at Anchored in Faith, PO Box 204, Oxford, Iowa, 52322 or email us at tv at anchoredinfaith.org. This has been a copyrighted presentation of Anchored in Faith Gospel Church, Oxford, Iowa.